So this is, and I haven't got many pictures. I heard Eddie Perez talking this morning. You have to have an obligatory graph and an obligatory picture. I'll end up with some pictures, but most of it is, is talking, but hopefully I can, can uh, keep you awake. This is Durban. We, we live on, we're on the coast of, South, of Southern Africa and have relatively high rainfall. But the country as a whole is water scarce. It has less than 600 millimeters of rainfall a year on average. So although we have a lot of rainfall, we have to be sure that uh, we use our fair share and, and that the rest is shared equitably with the rest of the country. Also, being a developing country, we are living with poverty. A large number of our people, no matter what definition you use, $2 a day, $3 a day, are earning um, in that range, 40%. We have about 800,000 people living in shacks and about uh, half a million people living in rural areas. So although we are a metropolitan municipality of 3.8 million people, we have these pockets that, that need to be served. When we were formed after the New South Africa in, in 2000, um, the city had a population of 3 million people. You can see it's grown to 3.8 in 12 years, largely because of immigration. Um, the natural population growth within the city has been um, cancelled by the deaths due to HIV and AIDS. We have a 35% incident rate of HIV AIDS in the sexually active population in our city. So, this inward migration puts a lot of pressure on to us to provide services and obviously leads to shack formation and also puts pressure on, on the environment when the services aren't provided. In that 12-year period, we've effectively wiped out the backlog in water. Uh, and this was one of the errors that we made, that we moved quickly. There was a demand for water politically and, and socially. And so we, we laid out water mains um, and soon everybody had a pipe very close to their house. And we think that contributed to this inward migration because suddenly you, we were, you know, here was a place where you could get water relatively easily. Um, and the water is safe to drink out of the tap. I guess one of the few cities in Africa where you can turn on the tap and drink the water and you don't get sick. It's the same quality of water as uh, you would get here in, in Sweden. The reality though is that we didn't do the same thing with sanitation. But it's also presented us with an opportunity. Um, there are still about 230,000 families with, with, they have toilets. I mean, most of those 230,000 have some form of pit or some form of toilet, but it is affecting the environment and uh, we need to do something about it. We also have been working in providing sanitation to these dense uh, informal settlements where those 800,000 people live. We, a few years ago, put in communal toilets because they're so dense, you can't put individual toilets in. You can't get to them, you can't service them, and so we, we used the communal block approach, and it failed dismally. Within three months, most of them were vandalized. And then I guess we did what we should have done in the first place, went to the communities and said, so what's the problem? What's your relationship with your toilet? What do you want out of a toilet? And they started talking about a place where they can go, this is dense settlements, remember, to get away from their husband or their wife and their children. They talked about singing and praying, and reading the Bible, and thinking about the day, uh, and they wanted privacy. And so we said, so what do you want in a toilet? Well, it must be clean, no smell. It must be light. I want to be able to read, right? And it must be safe to use. And most of our delivery was a smelly, dirty place, usually a VIP or a pit toilet with no window, for obvious reasons. And then we wondered what the problem was. So in providing um, a new generation of toilet with um, a caretaker and toilet paper and cleaning materials. We then found the acceptance went up to 85% and we've now had them in some of the early ones in for four years and they're still functioning fine. So that was a lesson to us in terms of responding to community needs and, and really understanding what it is that communities want. Our constitution gives you a right to access to basic water and a clean environment which implies basic sanitation. And so where, where the densities are, are sufficiently high, we can afford to provide um, waterborne sanitation. But if you move into an urban, into a rural area, it costs 10 times as much to provide piped waterborne sanitation. And so we realized that that was just not possible. And so we started looking at dry alternatives. But the problem that we've faced is that everybody thinks that the flushing toilet is the toilet to desire, right? Because that's what the rich people have. And now you give us this 
UD toilet or this VIP toilet, and uh, we're not really very happy with that because you're giving us something secondary. This shows you our municipality. This is our area of supply. To give you an idea of scale, it's 90 kilometers along the sea. This is the sea. Uh, oh, there's a point I can use it. This is the sea. So from there to there is 90 kilometers, from there to there is 70. And this red line, this area here, has waterborne sanitation. Conventional pipe sewage, sewage treatment works, treating to a, an environmentally safe standard. But this whole area here is largely rural. And that's where all the dry toilets are. Now, there we go. Clean, safe, well to use. So I'm repeating what I've said. But look at this last point here. I've heard a lot about paradoxes in this, in this uh, forum. We, we see that the toilet that we use is also a paradox because it was invented in 1860. And if you think what it does, it uses a whole lot of clean water. Just take urine for an example. A, an average family produces about four liters of urine. 80% of the nutrients are in that four liters of urine. The other 20% is in the fecal sludge. We take that and we add hundreds of liters of water to send it to a sewage treatment works to then remove the nutrients that are in that four liters. So you pump it and you transport it and all the rest, it's just crazy. Even worse, that water that we're using, those 200 liters or whatever of water a day, in South Africa, 30% of the water in a house is used to flush the toilet. 30% of in-house water use flushes the toilet. It's been purified, pumped, chemical costs, energy costs, to throw it into the toilet to move your waste, as I always say, that far. You put it in the bowl, there's a water seal that separates you from the smell of the toilet stack and the sewer. That's all that water seal does. It then moves it this far and it falls vertically down a pipe and your bath water and your kitchen water takes it away. And we think that's clever. The technology has not changed since 1860. And as I've said many times, if I gave you a cell phone invented in 1860, I don't think you'd be very happy with it if such a thing was available. And so we need to move away from this thought that a flushing toilet that uses all that kind of water in a water-stressed world with population growth is such a clever idea. So people like the Gates Foundation and Eva are looking at reinventing the toilet, thankfully, to find a toilet that doesn't need water, but that is as good as the flushing toilet that you have. And what's really exciting, I was in Seattle two weeks ago and see, saw the kind of products that they're producing. There are toilets now where there are coatings available that do repel our waste. Some, it's like an electrostatic charge and the waste doesn't stick to that bowl. It shoots off. It's incredible to see. There are sealing mechanisms now that involve simple mechanics. When you sit on the toilet, you don't even have to push a lever to flush like in the other. Merely sitting on the toilet or standing on the squat pan opens a vault where you can deposit your waste in the urine and then when you stand up, it seals and it goes away. So there are technologies which are relatively simple that already exist now thanks to the money that those kind of people are putting in. And if we can get them to the point where they work pretty well and are cheap enough, then we can legislate as local municipal authorities and bring about a change in no time at all. So I don't think that the solution is so far away. And then we're talking about the link to agriculture. I've heard a lot about the phosphorus um, shortage, and we, we understand that. Phosphorus is not an unlimited resource. It's going to run out. Everybody in this forum is talking about the water issue, but what about the nutrient issue? And if 80% of the nutrients that we, that we consume come out in our urine, and that comes from the fertilizers that we use to grow the crops in the first place, there's an enormous potential to recover those nutrients and reuse them. And we already have technologies that enable that to happen. I'll show you some pictures of one part of it now, getting to the end of my talk. If we can do that, if we can remove the nutrients at source, and my dream and this is the challenge to all of the technology boffins here. If we can have a thing like a washing machine out the back of our house that your waste goes into and out comes fertilizer, phosphorus, a bit of water, and energy, think of the load that will then result. It's nothing. You can put it down a 50 millimeter pipe. There's no solids. The nutrient loading is almost gone. So we're talking about reticulating cities of the future with small diameter sewers, Sending them to sewage works where the loading is a fifth of what it is now. You're basically treating industrial waste. So the cost of treatment at a centralized works drops, which means the impact on the environment drops to almost nothing because you, 
You're not putting nutrients back into the rivers if the works fails. So the, so the upside is enormous. The other thing is that we're accepting decentralization everywhere. You don't go to the bank anymore. You don't in South Africa. You don't have a fixed landline. Think of the poor cities in the developed world. They've invested billions of dollars in fixed line telephones, in fixed sewers, in centralized sewage works. And now we come as a developing country, just as we've jumped the, self, the telephone uh, generation. The, the mobile phones in my country provide coverage to about 80% of the, of the population. Almost everybody, in fact, everybody has a cell phone in South Africa. No fixed lines. We didn't have to invest a cent in any more copper cables. Now, the same potential exists for us in laying the sewage networks of the future. Small bore, decentralized, with the technologies that are coming around, I can see that that will be the city of the future. The other interesting thing is this one here. Windmills went out of fashion when? Who lives in the Netherlands? They were the in thing as an energy source. And now look what's come back, windmills. Um, we had steam engines as a, as a source of power, not turbines, engines. I recently was with a man who's now found a way to take a Ford motor engine and run it on steam very efficiently and recover the energy from sewage waste. And the engine does not corrode. But that's bringing in a person that had nothing to do with water and sanitation into our sector. And that's what we need more of. These people that have never heard of our fixed paradigm, that you have to have a centralized works and the sewers and all the rest of it. Bringing people in from coatings technologies, from different motive power thinking, I believe will help us to transform the way that we think. So, processing at source, as I say, offers attractive benefits in every aspect of life. And maybe that's what the city of the future is going to look like. Now, I can tell you that we have technologies now that recover the phosphorus and the nitrates. On my desk, I have a bottle of phosphorus that comes from the urine of my staff. You would not tell the difference, because we have one of our new customer services buildings, we now recover the urine into the basement and we process it through a reactor. And the phosphorus comes out. It happens. It's, the technology exists. Likewise, we now have a way to process fecal sludge through a machine. It exists. Uh, this is a picture of it. It's in two containers. It processes 12 tons of sludge a day. We try to take this fecal sludge from pit toilets and put it in a sewage works. I learned my lesson. I killed the works completely. It died. The bacteria said we cannot take this inorganic load, and the works literally collapsed. I'm sorry, we had to reseed it and start again. So we realized we had to find another avenue. So here we are loading fecal sludge. You can see a lot of rags. That's an, another story. Those rags are all the way that poor women manage their menstrual cycle. They use rags. Another challenge. How do we get rags out of VRP toilets in amongst all the other garbage that they put in it? The garbage goes through this machine and comes out the other side, relatively clean. The sludge goes through what I call a mincer, and then through this heating thing for eight minutes, and out the other side comes fertilizer pellets. That's your fecal sludge. There are no pathogens in there. It's completely safe to use. And of course, if you put it in nice white bags, then it's Enviro fertilizer from our own waste. That thing is producing the sludges today. So maybe I've given you a few things to think about, and maybe your city will one day learn from a developing city. Thanks very much.